Hello, everybody, and welcome to the post-award bid protest causes of actions webinar brought to you by uh, Whitcomb Selinsky. Um, today, we will be covering uh, uh, several topics around uh, bid, pro bid protests. Um, but to give you a little background on uh, the law firm, basically, uh, this is a Colorado-based firm that operates and handles cases nationally, uh, can, can work in all 50 states. Um, they are a very focused on helping people uh, in the, the veteran community. Uh, you know, half the lawyers and the attorneys at Whitcomb actually have, are, are veterans themselves. It's something that's near and dear to their heart to, to continue to serve in more ways than one, any ways they can. Um, and so that the, it's something that is really important to the firm. And so we're really happy to, to have uh, um, uh, Joe Whitcomb with us today, the founder and the pres president of Whitcomb Selinsky. Uh, he is a, uh, an Air Force veteran. He's uh, been in practicing law for quite a while, has a very interesting background, uh, very, very great, nice guy. Um, and, and he will be presenting uh, for us a little bit on, uh, you know, some, some of the areas around bid protests. He normally focuses on uh, international transactions and, and that kind of stuff. Um, we also have with us uh, Joel Hamner, who is a, a Navy veteran also, a, a, and uh, he, he focuses a little bit more into the bid protests. He kind of gets into the meat of some of the stuff around that in this webinar. So we really look forward to hearing from both of you and are really happy that you guys are here to, uh, um, to present to us today. Um, we, have, we do have uh, the ability for you to ask questions in the Q&A pane. So you should be able to see a button that says Q&A and, a, and you, can, you can go ahead and ask any questions throughout the presentation right there. We'll get to those at the end and, and Joel and Joe will take their time to, to answer those. Um, I am the moderator, my name is John. So I'll be driving the presentation. And so if there's any technical difficulties, go ahead and put your, your, anything in the chat pane and I can try to resolve it for you. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to introduce you guys to uh, Joe, and I will uh, unmute him and pull him up to, to get started. All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Whitcomb, and uh, today's presentation is going to be divided into two parts. Um, I'll be presenting first, as you heard John mention, my, uh, one of my senior attorneys, uh, Joel Hamner, will be presenting on the second half of our presentation and we'll be respectful of everyone's time, but there is a lot to cover today. Um, I will be covering, uh, we just, Joel and I just basically decided, decided to break this content up uh, like lawyers might uh, by jurisdiction. So I will be covering in the first half of this presentation, I will be covering protests that are generally uh, the purview of the Small Business Administration and Joel will be covering protests that, are, that fall under either the GAO or the Court of Federal Claims. So with that, um, I'm going to talk, uh, my, our very first slide deals with the types of protest that are under the jurisdiction of the SBA or the Small Business Administration. And those two different, those two types of protest include size standard protest, which are the most common, and status protest, and we'll cover each in detail, um, in, in some detail. Now, the, the questions that I will be attempting to answer for you in my uh, portion of this presentation include those that are listed on your, on your slide, which is when should I consider filing a, sta a size standard or status protest? Uh, how much time do I have to file? With whom do I file? What do I include in my protest? What happens after I file? What happens if God forbid I win? Uh, and then what happens if I lose this protest? Am I prejudiced in any way? Uh, does it hurt me? Um, so uh, the very first thing we're gonna ask you to do, um, trying to you know, rely on the Socratic teaching method is we're gonna give you a question to answer. Um, the very first polling question of today's presentation. Um, and, I, and I'll, I'll give you some time to answer it's yes or no. Um, have you ever questioned whether an awardee had the bandwidth to perform the contract for which you were competing? Uh, so the way this most typically plays out is you, you go to the trouble of putting together a rock solid 
proposal, you've gone and, and talked to subcontractors, you've hired additional people, or you've written letters of intent to hire people, and you bid on this contract, and then lo and behold, a company you've never heard of, and that no one's ever heard of, wins the contract. And then you start doing a little research, uh, and you start to unearth some things that give you real concern about the legitimacy of this company and its ability, or this awardee, and its ability to perform. Uh, the next slide will talk about uh, why you're answering that question. Um, the next slide just covers answering that first question under when or under what circumstances should I consider filing the most common of those protests, the size standard protest. Um, and, and what I want to preface this is by saying that uh, and by the way, 56% um, of you answered in the affirmative that you have questioned whether or not the awardee on a contract for which you were competing had the bandwidth or the wherewithal um, to compete. So that tells me that your intuition uh, is on and that you've, you've seen this come up in the past. So what we're going to give you, and again, none of these are hard and fast rules. Bear with me for a second. In other words... Um, no one of these is an automatic rush to protest. So the first question, but but any of them or, or all of them in the aggregate could give you reason um, to go file a size standard protest. So the first question uh, that most frequently pops up is that the awardee is either a, a, a joint venture or a teaming partnership between a small business as defined by the Small Business Administration and a large company, a company that would not qualify as a small business. Um, again, that, that's, you, you see that, that might be a reason to scratch your head, especially if you've never heard of that small business before. Um, the other thing you may learn through the course of your investigation uh, electronically is that the small business has no reported experience in anywhere near the scope of the award of contract. So maybe they're an electrical contractor but the biggest job you're aware of they've ever done in the past was a remodeling job for forty or fifty thousand dollars, and now this new contract is a four, four or five million dollar government contract. So that may give you reason to question whether or not they have the expertise and the wherewithal to perform that contract without uh, being unduly reliant on a large company. Uh, you may go investigate on SAM.gov, look up the awardees done. Duns or look up their name and find that they have only recently registered the company in SAM.gov. That, that doesn't necessarily mean you know, you know that they're a brand new company, but generally in that in that SAM registration, you can find a lot, there's about 160 data points to include when the company was incorporated, where it was incorporated, who the government's points of contact are, and that sort of thing. And that may give you information that will set, tell you, well, look, you know, these, this company has been around for five years, but their website indicates that they've never done the type of work that we're competing for. Or you may learn that yeah, they've got a great website that says that they're the bees, knees, and the cat's pajamas, but they've only been around for a couple of months as indicated or, you know, or for six months as indicated by Sam and by the Secretary of State's website. The third question that you may ask that may give you reason for pause is, is the procurement so large that absent your particular level of expertise and your secret sauce, you question whether any other small business could perform this contract without uh, significant support from a large business. So that, you know, again, that could look like a services contract that you're comfortable knowing that the small business has done that type of work before, but never, maybe they've never done it on the size that is on this contract. And, but for your experience and your fleet of vehicles and your people that, that you have working for you, you wouldn't be able to do it, but you just, you have confidence that the smaller business cannot, um, or, and those are all the things that you would, basically your allegation would be to the small business administration is that this company can only perform this contract if it has significant help 
from this large business. And you may ask the Small Business Administration to basically combine the two companies' receipts for the purposes for the purpose of determining whether this company is a small business. Um, so again, you're you're in a, you're going after a big contract. Maybe it was a bundled contract from, from other solicitations, and you're not confident that very many small businesses could perform. And then the last of these is kind of maybe obvious on its face, but a lot of contractors don't think to ask this question is, is the location or the place of performance so far removed from this company's headquarters? You know, they, their website tells you that they've, they're station they're headquartered in Mobile, Alabama. They've been there, you know, for 40 years, all of their work, all of their, all of the clients that they brag about are in Alabama. And now this contract award is in Los Angeles or Seattle. And you happen to have a presence in one of those two places and that and that this awardee does not. That may cause you to, you know, that may raise in your mind the allegation that maybe they're relying again on a large business. Um, and it will get into what happens if it's a so socioeconomic set aside. Um, and, th and that would be, you know, that for most people on this call, that would include STVOSP set asides or service disabled veteran owned small business or veteran owned small business set aside. You could include a woman owned a a <clears throat> hub zone minority owned set aside. And you have reason to believe that the, the awardee is relying on uh, a small business that does not meet those qualifications or a large business that is neither small nor socioeconomic. On the next slide, we'll talk about what types of uh, when you should be considering filing a status protest. So a status protest the definition of a status protest relates to uh, the, the procurement, the solicitation being a set aside. So again, this is a contract that is set aside for veterans or set aside for women owned companies or, or eight A's or minority owned companies or, or what have you. And uh, you, you believe, and maybe there's a teaming agreement or perhaps there's a joint venture agreement and you're, you're confident that both companies are small, but you know offhand that you know, one, you look at both of the SAM registrations and you learn that one holds himself out as a, as a service disabled veteran owned small business and the other company does not. They hold themselves out simply as a small business. Uh, and it turns out that the small business is situated where the uh, contract is going to be performed and the, and the STVOSB is not. That might give you reason to believe that at least as it relates to this contract, the SDVOSB or woman-owned company may be overly reliant on the non-SDVOSB or non-woman-owned company um, for the performance of this contract. You may also learn that the large, every contract the small business owner does, uh, they perform with their, your, their big brother company, a larger company, and they don't enjoy the benefit of a mentor-protege relationship then that might demonstrate undue reliance on that larger company. And when you think large company, we, we, when we say large company, we typically think of companies outside the definition of the SBA's size standard. So that, you know, if you're an office of attorneys, that's I think it's 12 million or 12 and a half million dollars in receipts, but it could also be, you know, a large, a larger small business that it still satisfies the definition of a small business, but it's not an STD OSB. It's not a woman owned company. And they're really carrying all the water uh, for this SDVOSB basically to just be able to tag along. And it's typically called a, a pass through or a storefront where the veteran owned business is just there for appearances and is not really um, going to be performing anything meaningful. And, and the term of art there is the primary and essential role of the contract. Uh, so simply staffing a phone for a document destruction contract may or may not be the primary and essential role of the contract. It, it may be that, that you also need to be in, in quality management, quality assurance, being doing something, something beyond just uh, answering the phone and bidding on the product, bidding on the on the uh, procurement. The uh, while John puts up our next uh, poll question, I'm going to cover the next topic, which is how much time do I have to file my status or size protest and the answer to the is the same for both types of protest so if the if the sba is is uh has jurisdiction then you have 
five business days from the time the agency announces its intent to award the contract to a specific contractor, right? So today is Thursday. If the contracting officer emailed you, what we call it, you know, disappoint, a, a notice of intent to award, and you were not the, the notice, you, you know, the government informed you that you were not the intended awardee, somebody else is. That's the starter gun. Your first business day, today being Thursday, your first business day would be Friday. And then you would therefore have, you know, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday, your bid protest um, would be due. And of course, it's important to remember that those business days do not include weekends or holidays, right? So in our in our question, in our uh, polling question, you're, you have to look forward in your calendar a little bit, but the award, notice of award came out, comes out on July 2nd, which is a Friday. The 4th of July is a, Independence Day is a Sunday and the government intends to celebrate or to um, uh, yeah, celebrate the 4th of July on um, July 5th on that Monday. So if you answer July 12th, uh, 2021, uh, then you gave then you gave the right answer um, because then the idea would be and um, about 14 percent of you uh, gave the right answer on that and, and let me explain why that why that's true so friday was the date of the award monday's a holiday so it doesn't count saturday sunday monday don't count tuesday is your first business day obviously tuesday through friday are four business days the following Monday, Monday the 12th, is your fifth business day and the date that your status or size standard protest is due. And that's super important, right? I was going to put a fifth answer on here. I'm going to call my attorney and ask him, right? And that's always a good answer. Uh, as soon as you get the notice of award, get on the phone with your attorney, um, and that's, that's a good way to go or, or, or get ready to file that thing. But know that you have five business days to, to file. All right, and the next thing we'll talk about on the next slide is with whom do I file that size standard or status protest? And again, for, for both of those, whether it's a size standard protest or a status protest, you file those protests with the contracting officer listed on the contract or in the, on, or in the announcement, All right? So, and then it's the contracting officer's job in a, in, a, in a size standard protest to forward that size standard protest over to the area, the, the Small Business Administration or SBA AO or area office, where the AO will then go out and I'll, I'll cover this in the next slide, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but it will then go out and do an investigation. We'll cover what that investigation looks like, but they'll go out and do an investigation, which entails getting documentation from the protested company to prove that they're small. Also, they'll get a copy of the proposal. They'll ask the contracting officer, uh, what, what is the primary and essential role of this contract? What, what should we be looking for the prime contractor to do? If it's a status protest over undue reliance or um, you, you know, some other, uh, something else you may know about the company's corporate governance documents um, or, or what have you, that protest will go through the contracting officer to the Small Business Administration's Office of Hearings and Appeal. And that is the, that's the office that makes the determination as to whether the contracting officer or whether, whether the company is, is complying with the regulations for an STDOSB or a VOSB or a woman owned or 8A or minority owned or hub zone. Then you ask, then the, then the question you need to ask yourself is what do I include in my size standard or status protest? And the most important thing is it needs to be more than a bald allegation, more than, more than mere conjecture. So simply stating that, you know, it's it just, it, it's my information and belief that they are relying too heavily on that large company, right? That won't do the job. But let's say instead the, the awardee, the small company announces on their website, we're so proud to have been partnered with Northrop Grumman uh, or, or for you not with uh, SpaceX for the launch of this satellite. 
in outer space. Obviously, no one here is bidding on a satellite launch. But if you read something like that, then you might conclude, hey, there's no way they're, they're not really doing anything, right? They're just relying on this large company. Another thing is it relates to a status protest, and this comes from real life, you know, ripped from the headlines, law and order style, is a company on its website announced um, with some fanfare the presence of a new president in the company. And it, you know, put out all of the information. And of course, it doesn't mention anywhere in this announcement that this, um, that this new president was a veteran or honorably served anywhere or any of that. This president came from Procter & Gamble, as, as, let's say, and we're so happy to have him on our board of directors and, and as the president of our company taking charge of things. You know, that would be an indication, well, look, you know, they are, the veteran is really not running the show. The woman's not really on it, running the show. It, this is this other person that's really running the show. And that could be incorporated into your um, protest and then sent over to, uh, most often when they come across to our desk, it's because the contractor actually knows the other contractor. So they, they're in a, they've worked together in the past. They, there's some insider baseball, they know what's going on and they allege those facts in their protest and say, hey, I know ABC company, I know them well, I know that there's, they have no qualifications to do this job. They're relying on the large company. Go ahead and the next one there, John. Uh, the, then the, I started to cover a little bit in a, in a couple of slides ago, what, or in the previous slide, what happens after I file? Basically, it's out of your hands, right? Then the, then the small business on a size standard protest, the, the SBA is going to reach out to the protested company. He's going to, the, 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 um, the SBA representative will get documents from the, like tax returns, will get the proposal, we we'll get all these documents so that they can investigate whether or not this small business um, is actually performing the contract, whether they actually meet this, maybe their receipts are too high. Maybe you looked up on usaspending.gov and it turns out this company that's holding themselves out as small won a $100 million contract two years ago. And so you think to yourself, well, there's just no way over three years are still under $10 million or $11 million a year, whatever the size standard is. That might be the basis of your protest and the SBA would collect tax returns um, and do that. You may learn, I, as I did, my very first size standard protest uh, six or seven years ago was from a, a, a company that had, they were a multinational corporation. Uh, they had just happened to spin off a subsidiary that believed themselves to be small and they were not because they were, they were affiliated with the larger company. Then the, the, then what happens is when the, the, the protests to go to the Office of Hearings and Appeals, OHA, then you have the contractor has the right to respond, and then you have an opportunity to intervene and, and write your response. Uh, go on, John. Go to the next slide. Oh, wait, go back. I'm sorry. Go back one more slide. I'm sorry. So what happens if I win? What happens if I win is that most commonly in a size or standard protest, the contracting officer is just going, going to go to the next lowest price or the next qualified best value offer and award to them. Now, if it just, that's the most common outcome in a size or standard protest. If in the event that the next lowest price is, re, is just astronomically higher um, and the contracting officer can't support paying that higher price, then the contracting officer has the right to cancel that contract and recompete it. Um, and that happens rarely, uh, but it can't happen. And then what are your options if you lose? Your options if you lose on that size standard protest is to appeal to the OHA. Um, and again, there's a, it's a briefing war. You're going to want to probably enlist the service of an attorney on that front. Um, and then if you lose at the OHA, you can go from the Court of Federal Claims. If it's a status protest, and you lose at the OHA, you can go to the Court of Federal Claims. And then ultimately, you have the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. And then lastly, and you know, rarely, rarely, obviously, the, the, the US Supreme Court. Um, but those are about one of the 1,000 odds that the Supreme Court will even hear your case. But as a right of appeal to the Court of Federal Claims, as a right of appeal to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. So that's the end of my presentation. I'll now turn it over to Joel, who will cover uh, the, the, the uh, GAO and Court of Federal Claims jurisdictions. Thank you, Joe. 
And we'll get Joel up here right now. Thanks. Great. Great. Thank you, John. I think you might have turned off the wrong one. Yeah, I did. My, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, it moved him. There we go. Sorry about that, Joel. No problem. All right, great. Hey, thanks, John. Thanks, Joe. Uh, so can you raise a protest for any other than size and status reasons? Well, yes, of course, right? There are a variety of reasons why an agency may have made an error in its award decision. We're, di we're gonna get, discuss some of those in more detail on the next slide. Uh, but the overarching theme for each of these is that they're about fairness and transparency in the procurement process. So if you've been in the industry for a while, um, you're probably familiar with the fact that every few years, uh, one or two members of Congress like to talk about revamping the bid protest rules, usually um, in ways that are adverse to contractors. Uh, in reality, this rarely comes to fruition. And the prime reason for that is because the bid protest process is one of the most important tools the industry has to demand integrity in the federal procurement process. As we talk about these various different types of protest grounds, uh, we'll normally be litigating in one of three places. It's either at the agency level, at GAO, the Government Accountability Office, or at the US Court of Federal Claims, uh, which I may refer to as, as COFC, COFC. Uh, as you work through, uh, one minute, could you go back, John, please? Yep. As you work through each of those forums, right, from the agency level, GAO, up to the Court of Federal Claims, uh, you'll see increasing formality uh, in how you need to present uh, your protest, uh, but there may be reasons for why you would choose one forum over another. Uh, and we'll discuss these considerations um, and some of the procedural differences among them in our webinar next month. Okay. So this slide is, is the meat of our discussion uh, for purposes of these protests. We're gonna walk through each of these, these common grounds. Uh, the, the purpose of them, of this slide in particular, is to put these in front of you. Um, these are many of the most common grounds that we see that lead to valid protests. Hopefully then you'll be equipped to go forward and recognize these kinds of issues out in the wild when you see them crop up in your own competitions. Before we dig into these, uh, it should be said that anybody who has dealt with bid protests before will be familiar with the significant deference that the procuring agency enjoys, uh, both from GAO as well as the court. Uh, the agency enjoys broad discretion in identifying what its requirements are, in determining how it's going to make its award decision, and in deciding who the award goes to. Of course, as, as we know, the government still manages to find a way to mess it up sometimes. Um, and these are the most common ways that we see. So the first uh, ground that I'm gonna talk about today is a deviation from the solicitation's evaluation criteria or their source selection methodology. So you've seen this piece in the, in the solicitation before, right? Uh, it's the small section in the solicitation, usually comes after the statement of work, and it's named something like evaluation factors or selection criteria. Um, occasionally, it, it might be under or near your submission instructions. And this section describes the factors or the criteria that the government is going to use to grade the proposals it receives. Sometimes this section will go on to explain how the agency will conduct its reviews. So for example, you may see um, you know, the three most common factors that you'll see, although there can often be more, but you'll see um, your technical proposal, your past performance, and your pricing, right? Sometimes then it goes further to explain how the agency will review each one of those. Um, it will tell you exactly what you need to submit and, and what it'll look for. Sometimes it's actually quite, uh, quite bare bones, right? In that same section, uh, you will normally see mention of whether the solicitation will be conducted as an LPTA. Uh, for those of us who were with us last month, we talked about LPTA and, and its alternative best value determination. LPTA stands for lowest price technically acceptable. 
essentially when the government runs an LPTA procurement, uh, they take a look at all of the proposals they receive um, and they make a thumbs up, thumbs down determination of whether your proposal is technically acceptable. Once they have a group of all the technically acceptable proposals, uh, then they simply pick the lowest price. That's LPTA. By contrast, uh, the agency can undertake a best value determination, right? In a best value determination, the agency is going to uh, be allowed to make trade-offs. And so the agency will look at various aspects of your solution, right, of your proposal. And uh, the, the agency is not required uh, to pick the lowest price. In all of these cases, if the agency is gonna pay more for arguably a better product, uh, they're going to need to provide some justification for why uh, they're going to spend more of the taxpayers' money for this better product, i.e. they're going to make an argument for this is a better value to the government at the end of the day. <clears throat> so we talked about at the beginning the evaluation criteria. Those are the factors that the government is going to look at in your proposal. We also looked at the source selection methodology that's either LPTA or best value determination, right? So I said earlier that the government has significant discretion, broad discretion, right? In determining a number of things, determining um, what its requirements are and deciding how they'll make their award. However, once the agency has set up those parameters in the solicitation, they do not enjoy deference in following their own rules. And that's where we get this deviation, right? This argument that the agency has deviated from what they stated in the solicitation. Government said, we're going to uh, evaluate proposals based on these factors. If they evaluate these proposals based on something else, right? Or not in the way that they described, well, then that's a deviation from what was stated in the solicitation. Similarly, if the government says, we intend to make an LPTA uh, award decision, and the government awards, of course, then to someone who is other than the lowest price, technically acceptable, well, then that is a deviation from the methodology that they articulated in the solicitation. When we file protests on behalf of our clients, we almost always include some argument along these lines. And the reason is because if you have a problem with most of these other grounds that we're going to discuss further in uh, in the, in the slide here, you will also have an issue where the government likely did not follow their own solicitation guidelines. A prime example of this is the next bullet point down, arbitrary or unreasonable technical evaluation. Now I include two terms here, arbitrary slash unreasonable. Um, this is reflective of kind of a nuanced standard that gets applied based on the forum. If you go to GAO, GAO will evaluate or review the agency's technical evaluation to determine whether it was reasonable. Um, I, I think that uh, oftentimes contractors are a bit surprised at how difficult, frankly, it may be to show that the, uh, the agency's technical evaluation was, was not reasonable. Um, but uh, we can talk about that in a second a little bit more. The other side of that is arbitrary, right? If we were to go and bring our protest at uh, the Court of Federal Claims, it's a slightly different, slightly nuanced standard there of arbitrary and capricious. The thrust of this issue is the same, though, across both forums. The thrust is this, that the government interpreted your technical proposal in an arbitrary or an unreasonable manner, right? So maybe the technical evaluation team simply misunderstood your technical solution in some way. Maybe they misread it, right? Maybe they inferred something uh, that you did not state uh, in your solution, in your proposed solution. Uh, maybe they placed too much emphasis on something that didn't actually matter to the performance or to the, the product or whatever it may be. Uh, maybe the, uh, um, the evaluation team decided that there was a component missing from your technical solution that wasn't actually called for in the solicitation. All of those would be great examples of an arbitrary or an unreasonable technical evaluation. Now I mentioned before that uh, the agency will 
um, be afforded a great deference and, and a, lo a lot of latitude, right, in performing these technical evaluations. Uh, that's not to say that this is not a, um, you know, a, a potential path or a legitimate grounds by any means, right, of uh, a post-award bid protest. It certainly is that. Um, I'll give you an example, right? We, uh, we handled a case not long ago uh, where the solicitation called for uh, the offerors to present certain information and to put that information into a chart, right? To, to populate a chart, put certain information there. Well, um, this particular contractor did that. Uh, they created a chart, they put it in their proposal. Um, they put the information in the chart. And they also included some information in the preceding paragraph introducing the chart, right? And uh, ultimately the agency decided that because that information was not presented in the chart, uh, that uh, the proposal was technically unacceptable. Um, well, uh, if you ask me, that is that is certainly an unreasonable evaluation of the information that was presented. Um, so yeah, you know, and ultimately again, GAO and COFC, they will both um, provide a certain amount of discretion to the agency here. Um, uh, but one thing that you will see and the most successful forms of this type of protest that I've seen is when this, when it is coupled, right, with what we just discussed above, where uh, the agency interpreted your technical proposal in an unreasonable way, and in so doing, they deviated from evaluating uh, your proposal according to the criteria that they say that they set forth in the solicitation. The third uh, ground that we often see here relates to price reasonableness or price realism determinations, right? This also relates to cost reasonableness or cost realism. Uh, that's kind of splitting hairs, but different solicitations are written different ways um, and you just need to present the information appropriately. Um, but uh, for purposes of our discussion today, look, everybody knows contracting officers are constrained by law to only pay a fair and reasonable price for something, right, for any contract. And then most folks also know the contracting officers have very broad discretion in determining what a reasonable price is. But there are two ways that this issue of an improper price reasonableness determination may come up as a bid protest. Either the government erroneously found your price to be unreasonably high, right? Now with as much discretion as the agencies are given in this, how do we go about proving that? Uh, well, normally we'll look at some things like the independent government cost estimate or the IGCE. We'll look at the price that the government has paid in prior contracts for these same products or services. Uh, we'll, to the extent that this information is available, look at competitor pricing. Um, you can usually, I mean, obviously you'll get the pricing from the ultimate awardee, um, but to the extent that you have any other insight into that, it's often helpful for building your case that the government erroneously found your price unreasonably high. The other side of this is when the government awards a contract to an unreasonably high, high, high price competitor. Right? And we'll look at all those same indicators, the IGCE, prior contracts and competitor pricing um, to make that determination. Shift gears a little bit here. And now we're gonna talk about price realism. Price realism is totally different. Price realism comes into play and, and essentially is, is there to um, address the issue of uh, whether the awardee, right, can possibly perform the contract at the price that they quoted, right? The awardee quoted a price that is uh, unrealistically low. What this does is it indicates that the awardee misunderstood some aspect of the solicitation requirements, right? And so you may, uh, see this in two ways too, for purposes of bid protest, right? The government may find that your price was unrealistic, or the government may, uh, may have not found that the awardee's price was unrealistic, when in fact it was, right? We prove this with a little bit more uh, technical insight, right? Uh, we won't necessarily look at other competitor pricing or the IGC, although that does provide some insight, but really when we're talking about price realism, uh, we need to look at 
um, some of the cost associated with that and, and the technical solution itself, right? And why the, the price that we're analyzing either is or is not realistic. Importantly, uh, the requirement for reasonable pricing is inherent in every contract, right? But the issue of price realism, interestingly enough, only comes into play when it is expressly stated in the solicitation, right? So you can't bring a price realism protest unless in the solicitation, the contracting officer has said something to the effect of um, that the, the proposals will be evaluated for price realism. Okay, looking down now through our list, uh, the next point that we have here is responsibility determination. What this is, is this refers to an attack on the awardee's responsibility. In other words, that's their ability to actually perform the contract. Right? This is a very difficult protest to win, but it is very important as well. Right? There are a number of uh, factors the contracting officers will apply to determine the contractor's responsibility determination. Right? I will point you right, for the full list to FAR 9.104-1. Right. Some of those factors, though, include financial resources, that the awardee has the proper financial resources to perform the contract, uh, that the contractor has the ability to comply with the schedule that's required under the contract, that the, the, the business has satisfactory business ethics or, or performance record. I will note that, except in very rare cases, a contractor's performance history will not determine whether that contractor is responsible or non-responsible, okay? Let me say that again. A contractor's relevant performance history, except in very rare circumstances, will be sufficient to be the sole basis for a contracting officer to find that contractor non-responsible. It it's usually has to uh, encompass a number of these factors uh, to show that a contractor lacks the ability to perform the contract. Okay, the next, uh, the next category we have down here is an organizational conflict of interest, also known as an OCI, right? Uh, OCIs have a, uh, a robust definition uh, in the FAR. For our purposes today, I think we can simplify that really to just say, Look, what is an OCI? An OCI is a situation that because of other activities or relationships, a person has an unfair competitive advantage. The most common example of this, right, is when your competitor is performing another contract for the procuring agency. And in its performance of this other contract, your competitor's employee has access to information that might be relevant to the solicitation. They had perhaps a hand in writing the solicitation requirements, or we've even seen instances in which uh, within the context of that other contract, uh, your competitor's employees may have provided input or recommendations on an award decision. That company should not also be bidding on this contract without a mitigation plan in place. There are three broad types of OCIs right, equal access to information, impaired objectivity, or biased ground rules, right? I mean, those generally loosely align with uh, kind of those three examples I just mentioned before. Okay, the next ground that we're gonna discuss is improper exchanges, right? Exchanges is just a big umbrella term uh, to refer to uh, communications, right? They just don't use communications because the terms communications and discussions, well, those are terms of art. They're defined in the FAR, right? And so we refer to both of those collectively as exchanges. And so the two types, um, well, in all circumstances, before I talk about both of those two types, in all circumstances, this is with respect to exchanges that the contracting officer has with offerors after the receipt of proposals, okay? Communications, refers to uh, exchanges that the government has before it establishes a competitive range, 
and discussions relates to exchanges the contracting officer has with offerors after establishing a competitive range. Now, there are a number of rights and responsibilities that apply in both circumstances, right? I again will point you for a more in depth approach to FAR 15.306. But the most important thing to keep in mind as it relates to exchanges is that these communications or discussions must be equal across all offerors. I'll note here that there isn't much deference that's given to the agencies. Either the agencies conformed with the requirements or they didn't. Either the agencies had equal discussions or they didn't. I will say though, while there isn't much deference that the courts afford, it is difficult to prove. Right? It's difficult to be able to have the evidence to show what exactly was said, what exchanges occurred between the contracting officer and your competitor. But the reason why GAO and, and COFC do not afford much deference to the agencies in this case is because um, despite everything else, both of those bodies are eager to protect the integrity of the procurement process. Doesn't always feel that way sometimes, um, but if you take a broad look at the different types of grounds, right, and the different types of cases uh, that GAO and COFC here, the ones that are most successful are the ones that somehow implicate um, uh, a lack of integrity or would otherwise advance um, transparency and fairness in the procurement system. And so that's why disparate treatment, our last topic here, is actually one of the most successful protest grounds, right, when raised. This is when an agency evaluates your proposal differently from your competitors in some way, right? Lots of times we'll see um, in the solicitation, we'll see certain criteria gets weighted. Um, well, maybe they apply that weighting uh, in one way for your proposal, and then they apply that weighting in a different way, right, uh, to your competitor. And so maybe, for example, your technical proposal is worth 50%, uh, your uh, past performance is 30%, and your pricing is 20%, right? Um, but then you had a sterling technical solution, uh, you have a perfect uh, past performance, um, but ultimately you miss out on the contract because you know, the government adversely rated your pricing, right? If they treated your competitor's proposal in a different way, and if they assigned um, you know, more stringent uh, analysis or evaluation of your proposal than they did your competitors or a certain aspect of your competitors, um, then that is potentially likely, right? Evidence of disparate treatment. It's important to note too, uh, that this means Look, if the agency even is stricter or more exacting in their evaluation of a certain facet than they are of your competitors, that too is a form of disparate treatment. So for the, the reason that I just mentioned, both GAO and COFSI are eager to, to affirm these protest grounds when again, you have the facts to prove it. But for that reason, we try to bring this cause of action anytime that we can, right? Um, because it is, um, it, it does enjoy, I think, kind of that, that special place uh, with GAO and COFC uh, where they feel like they need to, um, they need to act. Okay, uh, I'm going to pause now as we open our third polling question. And this just relates to um, the frequency, if, if any, right, in which um, any of you have seen some of these protest grounds in the past 12 months. So if you could just take a minute, answer yes or no. Okay. And while, uh, while you guys wrap that up, 
I'm going to talk about some of the other considerations that we take into account uh, when we talk about uh, what the decision whether or not to protest an award. Look, the fact of the matter is, is that every bid protest is a, a business decision, right? It's not just do I have the grounds on which to raise a protest, but what is my status? Am I an interested party? Both COFSI and GAO require uh, protesters to be an interested party. What that means is that uh, you have an, a, a financial or economic stake, right, in this ward decision. And so, um, unless you are an interested party in most post award situations, what that means is that you need to have submitted a bid. Not always, uh, but in most situations, that's what that means. I'm gonna take a quick break here and look at uh, the polling results. Um, it's, it's almost half, right? Um, half have probably seen one or more of these and then the other half, a little more than half have seen one or more of these, a little less than half um, have not. Uh, and that's the goal. That's the goal of this webinar is to equip you um, and, and kind of put in the back of your mind some of these things that you can be looking for um, in exactly how uh, those award decisions arrived at. Looking back again now to our other considerations, um, incumbent status is always important. Uh, GAO, you, uh, you see an automatic stay, um, and so uh, that, that gets applied on the performance and the incumbent will continue to perform on the contract. And so whoever that is often has a, a big uh, impact into um, whether, whether you decide to move forward with your protest or not. Secondly, uh, customer management. Look, the fact of the matter is many contractors are concerned about whether filing a protest will upset the contracting officer, turn them against them, right? Generally, from our experience, that is an overblown concern, right? From our experience, most contracting officers, most agencies recognize that's the price of doing business, right? If a protest is enough to turn the contracting officer against you, that usually indicates uh, there may be legitimate problems, right, with the integrity of the ward decision. So, uh, John, let's go ahead and uh, move on to slide 14, and we start this off with another polling question, and I'll give you guys a minute to look at that and read that. Just asked about how concerned would you be, right, filing a, pro pro a protest for fear of upsetting the contracting officer, what we just discussed. And again, this is a business decision and sometimes there are reasons to validate, right? Some concern there. If this is a contracting officer maybe with whom you have um, a longstanding relationship, right? Sometimes that can come into it. But uh, really generally what we would do is probably counsel look at your forum at that case. Okay, all right. Yeah, and so most of the responses here are kind of in the middle, right? Slightly concerned, moderately concerned, a couple that are seriously concerned. And again, that's, uh, it is one consideration. There's no clear cut answer to that. Okay, uh, we're gonna look very quickly here at task and delivery orders. The general rule on task and delivery orders are that these are generally not protestable, right? The theory is, is that the master contract was subject to the statutory requirement for full and open competition, but task orders and delivery orders are not. Whether we think that is good policy is a different matter, um, but uh, for purposes, often this comes up in IDIQ contracts, question of whether orders are protestable, generally they are not. I'll highlight one exception here. There are a number of them, but I'll highlight one. It's the first one. Orders that increase the scope, period, or maximum value of the master contract are protestable. And that makes sense, right? Because in those cases, the agency should have issued another contract for this work, right? That is not within uh, the scope, the original scope period of value of the, of the original master contract, right? And so if this, if this additional work should have been contracted for, then that other contract should have been subject to the requirement for full and open competition. Okay, so I just mentioned uh, above that, um, look, uh, bid protests are a business decision and you have to weigh a number of different things, but uh, to make that decision intelligently, we need to know what victory looks like. If you file at GAO, you'll 
get an automatic stay of performance on the contract. The incumbent continues under the predecessor contract and for the pendency of your protest, right, a stay will be in place. There's a process at COFSI where you go uh, through the request for a temporary restraining order that would essentially do the same thing, but it is not automatic and it's a little bit more um, procedurally heavy. I would say looking down now forms of relief for following a sustained protest, it's possible, right? Uh, that the court or GAO um, can direct the agency to award the contract directly to you, the protester, right? That's pretty rare. That's only in cases where it's like an LPTA where you had the lowest price, but for the agency's uh, wrong technical evaluation, you would have gotten the contract more likely um, what we normally see is some type of direction to cancel the award and then reevaluate or recompete. Right? And I will just mention briefly here that recovery of protest costs are, are certainly possible following the same protest. It is a little bit more difficult, a little more nuanced um, to get your protest costs uh, if the agency takes a corrective action. We'll see a few notes down there regarding agency corrective actions. Usually, this is basically the agency says, hey, um, in response to this protest, uh, we are going to take the following actions, A, B, C, and D, right? And then we'll move forth and go do that. In response, the tribunal will then, the GAO or COFSI, will normally dismiss the protest and the agency will take that action. Uh, the last thing that I'll mention here is, is the potential for alternative dispute resolution. This is always an option in both GAO and COFSI situations. Um, I think that the big benefit here is that uh, the decision maker usually tips their hand in this case. Um, and, and you can get a little bit of insight uh, into, um, into how your protest is going to shake out. Okay, uh, for the sake of time here, John, what do you say we turn to some questions? Sure thing. It does look like we have one, so I'll pop that up for you. And uh, are you guys able to read that? I, I am. Joel, are you able to read it? Yep. Um, I, and Joel, it's in your wheelhouse, so I'll read it and I'll let you answer it. And, and just for those, um, I'm, I'm not sure if everyone can see it, but if an IDIQ contract awarded to two contractors, then no task orders. 15 or 20 are given to one of the contractors because of the factors represented as much more important than cost or so levelized due to agency internal process not disclosed till after the award that the only decision factor is cost. What can a contractor do? And I think that Joel turns back to your, your conversation about whether uh, task orders under an IDIQ are protestable and under what circumstances. Well, I guess if I'm looking at this, it looks like there are a number of issues in in the, in here, John. Um, so yeah, you, you mentioned that there are no task orders. And so the protest that we would be talking about in this case would be um, uh, a protest of the master contract. And so that is protestable, right? The task orders, maybe not so much, but uh, the master contract would be protestable. And if I think that the big issue here is how, how the courts might resolve this one is whether this was structured as an LPTA or as a best value determination, right? And, and that should answer the question of cost. Now, that's not to say that the government's off the hook, right? Um, it, it seems like there is a moving uh, uh, goal line of, hey, what, what criteria am I actually being evaluated on, right? Am I being evaluated on cost? or on these other criteria that are much more important than cost. Um, and, and so in most cases, right, where we see kind of a moving of the goal lines, uh, the, the facts usually shake out that uh, one or more of those grounds that we discussed above um, usually come into play. So um, feel free to follow up with, a, with another question, John, if that didn't fully address um, you know, the issues that you raised, but I think that there's a lot there. Yeah, and, and for everyone's benefit who's been tuned in, the entire recording of this webinar will go out to everyone who registered for this webinar, including those who showed up. Uh, some, of course, weren't, weren't able to show up, but you know, this will go out. Also, as you see, there's an info at website or an email address on the last slide here. 
Um, but also there is uh, our website has, you, know, you can reach out to any of the attorneys on our website directly uh, through our website. So um, I'll, I'll turn this back over to John, but as the as founder of the firm and, and president, I, I want to thank everybody who showed up today um, and who joined our, our webinar. Thanks a lot, Joe and Joel. It's great to got, that you guys were able to do this and uh, you know help help educate some people in the marketplace about what might uh, constitute a, a bid protest. So very cool, very useful information. Thanks a lot for for doing it. Um, again, if anybody has any additional questions.